eat in here. It's my pleasure today uh, to introduce to you uh, our 29th Chief of Naval Operations. Uh, Admiral Gary Roughhead was appointed in September 2007 and uh, uh, he'll be our, our first speaker. Uh, I will tell you that the, the, the fact that he can travel to Newport to talk to all of you shows you how important uh, this uh, series of, of workshops and conferences and panels will be. It's uh, a very, very interesting and hopefully uh, will be a, uh, give you an idea of some of the things that we see in this future. We couldn't do this without the Naval War College Foundation. The foundation uh, now has over 6,000 members. It's the largest it's ever been and the network is expanding. I just can't tell you how pleased I am to be able to stand up here in this beautiful facility and talk to people who are loyal and support this wonderful institution now in its 125th year. This is our anniversary year and the class, the students graduating this year who are mixed among you uh, are uh, from the anniversary class and I couldn't be more happy. Uh, we'll graduate them on Friday. So without further ado, let me turn the podium over to our Chief of Naval Operations, Gary Ruffin. <laughs> Well, good morning, and it's really great to be back in Newport. Uh, Phil, thanks for uh, all you do to make the current strategy forum possible uh, to you and your staff. Uh, I also have to commend you on the fact that for every event that uh, I've been privileged to attend up here over the last couple of years, you've handled the weather magnificently. That sets Newport off in a unique way. Uh, but it is good to be back. Coming back to Newport for me brings back many, many memories, and in fact, uh, uh, last night when I arrived, my wife and I walked into an establishment, and the first person that I saw was my first department head in the Navy. Um, so, Cody, it was great to see you again, and it uh, reminded me of more carefree times, and then this morning, uh, had the opportunity to reunite with a friend of mine from high school, Joe Brito, who is here in the audience and has become actively involved in the foundation, so uh, I feel like I'm 18 years old again and we're going <laughs> to talk about a few things. I think that the current strategy forum is so important to be able to come to and have serious discussions about our national security uh, outside of the Washington Beltway because it's easy to get a particular perspective when you're inside Washington and to have uh, leaders, men and women from around the country, indeed around the world, come together to talk about things that are important to our future, I think is extraordinarily important. I'd also like to thank uh, the speakers that will be participating uh, in the forum, uh, especially my fellow service chiefs, my good friend General Jim Conway, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, and our new Commandant of the Coast Guard, uh, Admiral Bob Papp, who I've known for many, uh, many years. I normally stay at the current strategy forum for the duration because I find that simply being part of the discussion, listening to the comments, listening to the questions, uh, give, gives me an insight into the many issues that we deal with and, and as I said, perspectives that I normally don't get into Washington, but regrettably, as soon as this session is over, I'm on an airplane to Hawaii uh, I don't regret going to Hawaii, but uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, I will be joining my Japanese counterpart uh, there tomorrow uh, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Japan-U.S. Uh, security agreement. Uh, there will be the Japanese training squadron, a group of young officers uh, from our Navy uh, who will come together uh, to lay the foundation for what I know will be another 50 years of a truly unique uh, alliance and relationship that exists in the world today. Um, and I think that being able to do that really reinforces the theme of this conference, uh, which is partnerships and networks and the emerging global order. Uh, so in a way, I'll just carry the message from Newport to those young people that I'll be meeting with. Before I talk about uh, 
the future, uh, the perspectives that I may have, I think it's important to note that even though we are looking to the future, there should be no question in anyone's mind about the commitment uh, and the level of involvement of the United States Navy in the fight that we are in in the Middle East. On any given day for the past few years, uh, we have had more sailors on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan and in the Horn of Africa than we have at sea. In fact, today there are 14,000 sailors on the ground with ground units in headquarters uh, in those three areas uh, that are doing absolutely incredible work. 14,000 on the ground, 10,000 at sea on any given day, and in fact most of the fixed wing aircraft that are flying off of Afghanistan on any given day you'll see about 30 to 50 percent of the sorties flying off of Afghanistan coming from our one aircraft carrier uh, that supports those operations. But uh, before I speak about the networks and the partnerships that are going to be so important to the emerging global order, I'd like to speak about the importance uh, and the fragility uh, of that order that is uh, starting to emerge. Uh, the most recent global order or orders are worth remembering briefly before we delve into the circumstances we find ourselves in today. Uh, we had the uh, post-Cold War era, which I would consider to be that period of time uh, right before September 11th. We had the Cold War era. And we look back on those times in the world that we live in today, we look back on those times with a sense that perhaps there was a higher degree of relative peace. Perhaps partly because we did not have in those times, uh, with the exception of Korea many years ago and Vietnam uh, shortly less than that, we didn't have that commitment of large ground forces uh, committed on, uh, in, in conflicts there. And order in those areas was not necessarily maintained by this commitment, by the engagement of ground forces, but it was rather maintained by credible military presence offshore, uh, either at sea itself or uh, in the air with those aircraft coming from the sea. Uh, in those eras, we had the blockade uh, of Cuba, the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, and uh, that perhaps was the closest that we have ever come uh, to nuclear war. We had numerous non-combatant evacuations. We had SEAL and small unit operations. We had uh, aerial bombardments from land and sea-based aircraft. We had tanker escort duties in the Arabian Gulf, and we had numerous shows of force to help maintain the global order, which for the most part, the nation felt that we were at peace. So that was the old order. Those were the good old days where peace predominated, but not without plenty of skirmish, skirmishes that required our attention and where in many cases were handled by a constantly deployed Navy. So as we look at the emerging order today, one that has been shaped by the events of September 11th and one that will fully shape after we draw down from the ground activity in the Middle East, which will come at some time, uh, and as the President has said, is set to begin uh, starting next summer in the summer of 11, uh, based on the conditions of the ground, that's the area that we are now moving into. So how is that order going to shape up and how can we help shape it better? I think these are the questions uh, that the President got exactly right when he developed the national security strategy, strategy. He took stock of the world that we are living in today and uh, explained the strategy so that it could help shape a world that's more peaceful and more prosperous. An important part of that strategy for peace and prosperity was to promote a just and sustainable world order. I couldn't agree more on the importance of that international order, nor could I feel more strongly that the emerging international order, the one that will emerge in full as the forces draw down in the Middle East, is largely influenced by a strong American Navy working with global maritime partners. And I know that is blatantly and shamelessly parochial. 
but I'm told because I'm the CNO I can say things like that. Um, but I'm also going to try to explain to you why. If we use the past as a rudimentary guide, naval power will play a large role in pressuring or influencing international players in the global order and in targeted rapid response. The global orders that preceded 9-11 were in large part maintained not by invasions or large ground forces or by teams ashore, but by units offshore and small units quickly inserted onshore. Looking back, it's clear that we remain the maritime nation that we have been since our founding. That's just a quick look back. But looking forward, we will still need, as I say, our webbed feet. Today, globalization and the global order it survives by thrives on the uninhibited international exchange of resources, goods, and ideas. The international exchange of goods, resources, and ideas happens predominantly at sea. Commercial ships transport the vast majority of goods. Tankers transport the majority of resources, and many resources come from the sea itself. And ideas and money crisscross the globe in seconds by virtue of underwater cables that uh, lay on the ocean floors. And in fact, I often say that the internet swims with the fishes. The order and stability of the maritime commons, however, cannot or can be disrupted by pirates, by terrorists, by nations staking territorial claims or fighting with their neighbors, or even climate change and natural disasters. What's more is that there's a lot of ocean out there, much more ocean than land. And so there is a lot of area that we must cover. And if you consider the changes in the Arctic, the oceans will only increase in size. But we alone don't need to cover all the world's waterways against the many different threats. There are, after all, global commons that ought to be served by a global response. And this is where partnership fits in, and specifically global maritime partnerships. We in the Navy and the Marines and the Coast Guard embarked on strengthening and expanding those global maritime partnerships long before the national security strategy, long before the most recent quadrennial defense review. We documented it in 2007 in the Cooperative Strategy for 21st Century Sea Power, which is the title of our strategy and which Phil has uh, given you in your packets today. We released it right here in Newport, Rhode Island, the Commandant of the Coast Guard, the Commandant of the Marine Corps and I, uh, in 2007. And two quick examples of the strength of that partnership. Uh, one which took place here last October when we convened the International Sea Power Symposium again, where 102 countries came together and 92 maritime leaders joined in this room to talk about the opportunities for the future. But even in a more practical sense, it's at play every day in the world. Most specifically in the Middle East, where we coordinate a task force, Task Force 151, uh, which is a collaborative counter-piracy effort, effort and the only place in the world where China, Russia, the United States, Greece, Italy, Japan, the UK, Malaysia, South Korea, Turkey, Australia, and many others are operating every day together in a cooperative effort to curtail the scourge of piracy that exists in the Somali Basin. Beyond strengthening or forming new multilateral partnerships, we in the Navy form a strong bond for our nation's bilateral relationships. Uh, my trip to visit my Japanese counterpart is one example uh, where we work with the Japanese Navy at the high end of warfare in the area of ballistic missile defense and anti-submarine warfare. I've also returned recently from a trip to India where our ships, our sailors, our aircraft are working cooperatively with our Indian friends where we continue to increase the level of the exercises that we have with India. And before that, I was in Djibouti, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar, where our sailors are training and exercising and assisting our partners and allies. Those are just a few examples 
of the cooperative partnerships that we enjoy. But suffice it to say that our Navy is on every continent and in every ocean reassuring, strengthening, developing old partnerships and new and emerging partners in this effort uh, to look to a more cooperative and collaborative global maritime partnership. The way we reassure, strengthen, and develop our friends and allies, which is the currency of our partnership, has stayed relatively stable over time. They're based on personal relationships. They're based on financial and diplomatic support. And I emphasize that they are based on credible military power. And I say credible because if you don't think those other countries around the world are monitoring and tracking and studying what we are doing, I urge you to read many of the academic journals and the white papers that come from countries around the world. They pay attention to what we do, what we say, and how we invest in our Navy and in our military. The credibility of naval forces rests on a capacity to be global and an ability to carry out the six core capabilities that we list in our maritime strategy. To be a forward Navy, to be a Navy with that credible power that can be a deterrent force, to be able to control the seas, to be able to project power, to be able to operate in maritime security schemes, and to be able to provide disaster response and humanitarian assistance. And even as the global order changes, as nations and non-state entities change, these fundamentals will not change significantly. The currency of partnership will remain credible military power and commitment. That will not change. But while the currency remains the same, the finances available for that military power at home and around the world are changing. And they're giving rise to new regional centers of power and challenging once established powers. Other panels and some of the experts that will join you in this forum will cover this in detail. But in general, the strength of our nation's defense is predicated on the strength of our nation's economy. And as strategists, we must juxtapose the reality of compressed defense budgets against a growing demand for military and especially naval power around the world. Without diligence, this juxtaposition could easily become a mismatch where resources are insufficient to meet the expectation of global influence and engagement. In the past, as we entered a downturn in the defense budgets, we could rely on a fleet that had been built in the upturn. We could rely on a resilient industrial base that could weather the lean years. We could even rely on a personnel base that was either large enough to solve any problem through sheer manpower or a personnel base that could be significantly reduced without a significant effect. But in this downturn, it is different. And this time, it is different for the Navy. This time, it is different because we're the smallest Navy that we have been since 1916. This time, it is different because the fleet shrank in the last period of budget growth. This time, it is different because we have a strategy of engagement, of being out and about, a strategy that requires us to be in more places in the world. This time, it is different because the high-tech threats are proliferating at a faster and faster rate. And they are simply not proliferating among nations, but they're proliferating to non-state actors. This time, it is different because our industrial base which in the last downturn consisted of six major shipbuilding corporations, consists of two. And this time it is different because for us in the Navy, where we dep uh, depend upon our nuclear-powered uh, aircraft carriers and submarines, that part of the industrial base at one point involved eight corporations, and now it is down to two. This time it is different because we've already reduced our personnel numbers by 16 percent and we saw a commensurate rise of cost by 13 percent when we did that. But I would also tell you, whereas that may all seem negative, this time it is different because we have the best sailors with whom I have ever served in in my nearly 40 years in the Navy. 
This time is very different from those in the past, and that's why I applaud Secretary Gates for laying out some very provocative questions in his speeches that challenge the status quo assumptions. And I think it's time for those provocative questions. It's time for creative thinking and new processes, but more importantly, it's time to act. And we in the Navy have been acting on that. Shortly after becoming the Chief of Naval Operations, I truncated a major shipbuilding program because that ship did not meet the needs of this emerging world order in the capabilities that it was going to provide us. We canceled two shipbuilding contracts uh, for littoral combat ships because the prices were outrageous. We've recently made the decision to downsect, downselect the littoral combat ship to one variant uh, so that we could get a more affordable ship and begin to build those ships in numbers. We've canceled unmanned systems and missile programs that were not delivering on the investments that we made. And we are in the process of reimagining naval power with cyber power and unmanned systems. We've changed our processes to improve the decisions that we make. In the Department of the Navy, we've brought together uh, the directorates for intelligence and command and control so that we can look at information and cyber in a complete way and make better decisions. We've injected into our decision-making process total ownership costs of manpower and energy, things that will continue to drive our budgets in the future. I'm proud of what the Navy has done, but I really do believe that we must go further. And there are more provocative questions to be asked. We must ask about the potential for procurement squeeze, for growing operations and maintenance costs, and an unsustainable rate of increase in personnel costs are going to continue to squeeze us. We must ask if our personnel policies are sufficient. I find it interesting that the personnel policies that we follow, which are based on the laws that the Congress passed, the most recent law that deals with personnel policies was passed in 1986, at a time before we became this very effective joint force that we are today. So how do those laws and policies have to change in the future? And we must ask if our procurement process is adequate for the environment in which we live, where we let a contract on a ship and yet the technology will move rapidly in the seven to ten years that it will take to deliver that ship. Those are the types of questions that we have to ask. And most importantly for you over the next couple of days, we have to ask if we believe that our naval forces today are and will remain sufficient to influence the emerging world order, either through networks, through partnerships, or when needed for us to act alone. Our Navy is very different than the larger navies of the past. And while our Navy is very different and much smaller, we're also facing a new emerging order that I believe requires more naval power. And I ask everyone here to consider the implication of these changes for our nation and our Navy, to ask those questions, and to have a serious conversation about our strategy for the future. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll repeat the question. In light of our uh, much reduced uh, force, military force, uh, the Chinese naval buildup, especially their submarine and intercontinental ballistic missile capabilities, including EMP threat, and, and in addition to that, I uh, talked to General Petraeus the other day, that we concerned me and many others have about continuing cyber attacks. All right. Well, thank you very much. The the question was the view that we have with regard to diminishing resources and the Chinese buildup in submarines, ballistic missiles, sub, uh, ballistic missiles, and also in cyber. Um, 
you know, I, I have had the privilege of being able to have some insight into the PLA Navy uh, since about 1993. Uh, I've been able to visit their Navy, uh, spend time with their leadership uh, to include the current uh, chief of the PLA Navy on about four occasions in the last uh, couple of years. And I think it's important that we pay attention to those developments and, 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 and look at that order of battle. But for me, I think it's important that we understand uh, how that Navy is being used and what those changes uh, are, and, and particularly the operational patterns. And I think that's what, what we need to look at more clearly and also to uh, cause the PLA Navy, the PLA, and China to be uh, more open and more transparent and engaging uh, with us and look at ways that we can uh, move forward in a, in a cooperative way. Uh, as I mentioned in one example, we on a daily basis are conducting operations with the PLA Navy and we've been doing that for about a year and a half in the Somali Basin. Uh, and I think those are some good examples of how we can work together in a very cooperative way. Uh, but I do watch uh, the developments in the PLA Navy. I would submit that uh, those developments are even being watched more closely uh, by countries in the region. And uh, our effort will be to engage the PLA, the PLA Navy, and uh, gain a better understanding of what they're about. Yes, sir, back here. Thank you for your remarks, Admiral. Uh, just to follow up on that question, I think in late May uh, of uh, this year, there was a presentation by one of the very senior uh, PLA admirals, I think it was Wu, to a delegation of uh, senior American, uh, you know, in Beijing, where he publicly said that everything that was going well between the United States and China was because of Chinese initiatives. Everything that was going poorly was because of American initiatives. And that was, at the time, one of the more threatening comments from their leadership. And it was poobahed by, I think, our Secretary of Defense. But then the commentators from China have come out since then on several occasions saying that no statement like that gets made without the party's support. So it would seem, that at least from that side, that the uh, relationship is not as good as we would have hoped it to have been, and we don't see, we haven't seen much coming from them on the North Korean incident or as much on Iran as we had uh, hoped. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could tie that into your earlier statement and the earlier uh, work that we've done with the Chinese. Yeah. Well, I think that, uh, you know, deal with China, there's just always the political level uh, activity that's going on and the, and the political engagement. Uh, but for uh, the Navy and the PLA Navy, I think it's important um, to note that we are working in a cooperative way in, in the Middle East. Uh, that uh, as the engagements sometimes wax and wane because of events that take place in the world, that, that we have been able to advance uh, those uh, exercises, that we have developed ways to communicate with their ships uh, while we were at sea. Um, and I would also say that uh, having the opportunity to talk to my counterpart when there is a little bit of a, a burble, um, in activity that takes place as, as took place uh, in their exclusive economic zone uh, a little over a year ago, uh, I believe allows us to, uh, to continue to uh, gain better understanding and to, have, have, and to allow those types of activities to continue to uh, develop over time and use that as what I call a flywheel as some of the political activity uh, moves up and down. Yes, sir, over here. Morning, Admiral. Morning. Uh, I, I'm pretty loud. If you, uh, I'll, I'll try to talk loudly. I have a nearby. Early on the first day. 
There we go. Okay. Good technology. Uh, um, Admiral, uh, um, in, a, in a recent issue of Foreign Affairs, Robert Kaplan suggests that the Chinese will indeed have more nuclear submarines within 15 years uh, than, than we will. I wonder about your comments on those rough expectations. And uh, at the same time, while the Chinese will be expanding their uh, maritime fleet uh, dramatically over, over this next decade or two, uh, at the same time, up in the Jingjiang, westernmost part of their country where the, uh, um, I, I have trouble pronouncing it, the Uyghur Turks, uh, live, they may have considerable problems to face. And I wonder if you can somehow put those two things uh, in position or something yeah. like that. No, thank you. Um, one, I think that the growth in the PLA Navy's nuclear submarine fleet in 10 or 15 years uh, on the nuclear side, uh, I don't see the numbers generating uh, to exceed ours. As you know, our submarine fleet is, is all nuclear and extraordinarily capable, particularly with the advent of the new Virginia-class submarine, which has turned out to be an incredible boat for us. Um, but they are building uh, a large submarine fleet, um, and, and I've had the opportunity to be aboard uh, one of their newer submarines. And, um, and it's a, it was a very you know, well-maintained boat with a very professional crew on board. Um, so I think we'll see continued em emphasis on the submarine fleet, but I, the nuclear fleet, subfleet, will rise a little bit slower. I think you point out the, uh, the issues of China in the West and, the, and, uh, and, and simply the vastness of the country, uh, that uh, it, you know, there are issues that, that uh, the leadership in China will have to deal with that are apart from the naval dimension. And, and so I think it is important that as we look at China, that we look at China in its entirety, uh, that we also look at the relationship that we have with China simply beyond the, the security uh, sphere and, and, and also take into account the economic aspects. But uh, I kind of look at China as a very large uh, country where uh, governing at times I'm sure can be challenging um, and, and look at it in that bigger, bigger picture. In the back, yes, sir. Good morning, Admiral. Um, you touched on things having to do with technology and canceled weapon systems and, and meeting needs going forward. And with the United States spending about as much uh, in terms of one country as the rest of the world all put together on defense, do you think that in this rapidly evolving technological uh, age um, and the events in international relations, we have a good dynamic right now of anticipating future needs so that we don't get into eras where we're canceling programs, we're questioning the effectiveness of spending. Um, I, I think it means bringing together, obviously, people such as yourself and intelligence people and and more, um, are we getting better or worse, do you think, at the dynamic of anticipating future needs to increase the effectiveness of military spending to keep, to keep our country strong, or do we need to do something differently? Yeah, I, I, uh, it's a great question, and uh, that's my life in Washington, is trying to look into that, that very clear crystal ball that, uh, that's in front of us. Um, and, and I would say that, that we do have, and I, you know, I highlighted the, that bit of legislation back in 1986, and I really do believe that we as a military and, and, uh, have, have really been able to come together in, in a joint way and look across the range of capabilities that we have and, and to look into that future and see where we need the capabilities. But I would also be reminded of the fact, uh, and I go back in time, that when Secretary McNamara was being asked at his confirmation hearing about the future, um, never mentioned Vietnam, when then uh, Secretary-designate Cheney 
Secretary of Defense designate Cheney was being asked at his confirmation hearing. No one asked him about Kuwait and Iraq. And, um, and then when Secretary Rumsfeld came around again for his confirmation hearing, I don't think anybody asked him about Afghanistan. And so the challenge that you have is trying to look into that future and see the types of trends that are occurring. And as I look, I also look at the, at the imperative that we have as a nation, which I truly do believe that we are a maritime nation, uh, and, and that we have global interests. And in order to get to the area where those interests are, we have to cross two great oceans, which generates a force structure that we need to be able to keep that rotation going. The types of uh, ships and airplanes that we have have to be able to sustain themselves for long periods of time while they are deployed. And then as we look at where the technology is taking us, um, I think we, we look at where the, the, the uh, uh, recent developments are, uh, ballistic missiles being one of them, and that is, is why you're seeing us uh, move more toward a more robust uh, integrated air and missile defense capability. We see that submarines are increasing in numbers and in complexity uh, around the world and we're making investments to be able to counter that submarine fleet to keep the sea lanes open. Uh, and that was really the basis behind the decisions that we made here in the last year. Uh, take this area of information and make it more central to who we are. In the Navy, we've been focused very, very narrowly on And in my mind, the world has changed, and the role of information is going to become more and more important. So that's why we've gone through this organizational change, why we have created an entity that looks globally uh, on information activity uh, for the Navy around the world, and why we've taken all the specialties that are in that world of information and put them into one core where we manage them as a core. And when you do that, you're talking about 44,000 people. Uh, so those are some of the changes that we have in mind. Uh, but I still believe that as we look to the future, uh, that the maritime environment is going to remain important. When you see the demographic shifts that are pushing more and more people down to the coastline, uh, when you see the creation of mega cities, which for the most part are in the coastal areas, when you consider the effects that the climate may have on, 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 on the way of life in those littoral areas, uh, I think that that talks about uh, the importance of the maritime force. And when I talk about that, I'm also talking about the unique partnership that exists between the Navy and the Marine Corps. The ability to be deployed, the ability to remain at sea, the ability to not have to have a footprint ashore when issues of sovereignty are going to become much, much more important and more acute in the future. Uh, and so those are the types of things that drive our thinking and where we're trying to take the Navy into the future. Yes, sir. Well, you have substantial assets in, in, in uh, offshore Somalia, and I wonder what's the ultimate fix for that problem that continues and uh, I guess the Russians have their own solution on dealing with some of the piracy out there, but wh where do we go from here? On yeah. Well, uh, thanks for the question on piracy. I, you know, it's, uh, I think for those of you that obviously have an interest in, in uh, matters, uh, you know, we are patrolling an area that's four times the size of Texas and a coastline that runs, you know, the equivalent of Maine to Florida. Excuse me. And we'll continue to do that. I think the, the, that the partnership that has developed, you know, I refer to it as the strange bedfellows. You know, five years ago, if you said the Chinese, the Russians, the U.S., the EU, NATO, Malaysia, India are all going to be in a military operation together, I don't think anyone would have bet on that. But that's exactly that, what we're doing. Um, but the solution to piracy off the coast of Somalia will not be solved at sea. We can minimize it. We can deter it. We can respond and, and, uh, and keep ships from being pirated. But the fact of the matter is, until there's rule of law, until there's governance, until there are consequences for the criminal activity that lives ashore and moves ashore, 
and the finances that flow from the shore, uh, we're going to continue to be chasing pirates in the Somali Basin. Uh, governance ashore is, is, is where the solution resides. And we've seen that case in uh, the Straits of Malacca, same problem. But Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand came together. But they also had the benefit of, of, of uh, law enforcement structures ashore that you could squeeze the pirates uh, from the sea and from the shore, and they were essentially able to eliminate that. Yes, sir. Yes, I'd like to ask you, um, you spoke about the three eras, the Cold War, uh, the post-Cold War, post-Cold War, and then the current era. And I wanted to uh, question you about the issue of the alignment between economic strategies, political strategies, and military strategies. During the Cold War, the alignment seemed clear. There was a Iron Curtain, there was a defense shield, the United States was mm -hmm. the largest economy, and our political, economic, and military were all aligned around a common strategy. With the collapse of the Soviet Union in that first, what you call the post-Cold War era, it seemed that Americans were happy we were the only superpower, we're the economic superpower, but it raised the whole question about our military position with the disappearance of the Iron Curtain. Who are our friends? Who are our enemies? What's our military role now that that's collapsed? In this, you would call the third era, we now have rising economies around the world that want to share a global economic strategy with us mm -hmm. that we once had individually. Same time, that projects them into a political role around the world. And as we hear, now there's a military role around the world that they want to secure their global economic interests. How do we interface with this? And especially in the context of two wars in Islamic countries where you have a couple of billion people that are sharing a Mm -hmm. in that context, how are we going to align the three strategies? Yeah. I think uh, clearly the, um, you know, I'm, I'll leave the political and strategy. When you look at the relationships that we enjoy around the world and, uh, and this idea of, of uh, global maritime partnerships, they really do tend to transcend um, uh, regions. They also transcend, uh, I would say, ethnic and religious uh, uh, boundaries that may exist. Uh, you know, we in the Navy were were very uh, pleased, and proud of, for example, of our friends in in the tiny tiny country of Bahrain, that became the first Arab country to lead a maritime task force in history. Uh, and they did it exceedingly well, and now we've moved on to the UAE and to Kuwait. Saudi Arabia is also participating. And so the thing that I find uh, that's greatly beneficial with naval forces is that we can come together, we can act, we can cooperate uh, in ways that, that don't carry a, a lot of the triggers of, of political concerns that you may get when you're operating ashore. So I think that, though, that this idea that we have been able to advance and the growth and the power of some of these partnerships, the, the cooperative nature of what's going on in Somalia, where you have many different countries that politically and economically you think, well, maybe in competition with one another, we're all working in a cooperative way. So um, you know, some may think I'm naive in thinking that we can continue to do more, but I look at what we're doing in the Arabian Gulf, I look at what we're doing in the area of uh, piracy. I look at the huge international force that comes together from the sea for disaster response. And, and I do believe that it can be the basis for cooperation that perhaps can enhance and feed some of the other areas that, uh, that will be important in the future. Sure, we'll take a couple more here. Angela, in the back. Yes, sir, good morning. Good morning. Angela Katzen. Sir, you recently signed out the uh, Naval Operational Concept of 2010 with the uh, conjunction with the Marine Corps and the Coast Guard, mm -hmm. in which you laid out a very aggressive um, uh, naval strategy for us. 
My question to you is very simple. Uh, what is your biggest challenge? What keeps you up at night? Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, <laughs> I have a great staff. I sleep well. I mean, I can't, you know, so I really do. Um, I, you know, for me, the biggest challenge really is capacity. Uh, there have been some questions about the capability growth and what have you, and, and, I'm, and I'm not uh, sanguine and, and uh, thinking that the capabilities we need and the overmatch that we as a Navy enjoy in capabilities uh, will continue on into the future if we simply let them, you know, meander. Uh, but right now we enjoy a very, very good capability overmatch. As far as the, uh, you know, if you go into uh, submarine forces around the world, um, there's nothing, nothing that can approach uh, our nuclear submarine force. And particularly with the Virginia class that we've just introduced, nothing there. Uh, we're bringing on the Joint Strike Fighter. And, and you know, you can debate the, the, how the program is doing, what have you. But the fact of the matter is that's an incredible airplane and we in the Navy look forward to getting uh, that on board our aircraft carriers. Uh, in the area of integrated air and missile defense, extraordinary capability. Uh, no one is able to do the types of things that we do from our Aegis ships around the world. So I think we have a very good match. We have to stay ahead of it. That's why we're pursuing systems. Uh, and autonomous systems, which I think will help the environments in which we'll operate in the future. The biggest challenge that we have is capacity, because you can talk about networks, you can talk about moving information back and forth, uh, but it, it's the same, I would say, ashore as it is at sea. A, a force can only be in one place at one time. A ship can be in one place at one time. Um, and there's a lot of ocean out there and the demands continue to increase, whether it's uh, for uh, the work we're doing off Somalia, uh, if it's continuing to engage with our partners around the world, because uh, we can talk about virtual engagement and, and distance support and what have you, but when you are uh, working with friends and partners, uh, they want to know that you will be there and you need capacity to do that. Uh, that's why we're going to the down select uh, on the littoral combat ship. Um, that's why we're moving aggressively forward with the joint strike fighter. Uh, so capacity is, is the key. And, and that's where I think we have to have a serious discussion, not only about the types of things that we're buying and that we can buy them in the numbers that we need while preserving that capability overmatch, but uh, when I talked about this time being different, uh, I think there has to be a fundamental discussion about the strength and the robustness of our industrial base and the ability for us to, um, uh, to have a base that can generate the types of capabilities and the capacities that we need in the future. Because, as I said, this time it's different. It's not as robust as it used to be. Look at some of our friends around the world and what has happened to their manufacturing capability. And, and I know for those of us who wear the uniform, uh, I can go to a shipyard and I can take an electrician from a shipyard and I can put him into the housing construction industry and they'll do just fine uh, the very next day. I can't go to the housing construction industry bring somebody into the shipyard and say, wire up this Aegis destroyer. It's a very different game. And so when we think about the industrial base, we sometimes think about the physical plant. But the industrial base, as is our Navy, is about people, with the skills, with the talent, and the commitment uh, to build the machines that we need to address our interests around the world. So it's capacity, and I think when you talk capacity, there has to be a serious discussion about the industrial base. I'm going to take two more. I'm going to take the gentleman in a uniform, uh, or right here. This I'm sorry, lady in the uniform. Right. Yes. Mistaken all the time. Linda Bradley Davila. I don't my glass. I don't have my glasses on. So. <laughs> so. My question is: When we speak about capabilities, when we speak about capacity and the demands, what will we be looking like 
for futuristic deployments? What, what do I think? Uh, futuristic deployment? Yes, sir. Yeah. I, well, I think the deployments will be uh, a function of, of the size of the fleet and the commitments that we make in various regions around the world. Uh, and I can tell you that demand, the demands are increasing. The combatant commanders continue to ask uh, for more capability. And it's not just ships and submarines, but it's some of our expeditionary combat command units that we have. Uh, this year, we're actually increasing our riverine force because we think that there, in the future, will be uh, opportunities and, and demands for that force to interact with partners around the world. But um, uh, you know, one of the things that we also know is that we have to monitor the length of deployments and the and the uh, cycles of those deployments because as a, as, uh, as a force we do what we can do because of our people and you press that force too hard as we found out in years past uh, and things change. Right now we are enjoying the best retention and attraction to military service that I've seen in my career. Uh, in some ratings we're making retention goals for the first time in 38 years. And there's no question that the economy is a factor there. But we've also been doing things differently in the Navy where we're working on the life-work balance and what does it take to attract and retain uh, young men and women into the Navy. Uh, what are the opportunities that are there? And that human dimension of who we are is something that, that has to be put into this rotation balance and deployment balance. Uh, what we have found is six months gone is uh, probably good. We've stretched out a couple here recently to seven and seven plus. Uh, and I think anything over that, we begin to put some pressures uh, on the human dimension that can cause changes in, in retention behavior. We have to watch that. Um, any deployment that exceeds the red lines that we've established, I personally approve because that's how critical I consider it to be. And I can take one more down here from an old friend. Dick Diamond from Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, CNO, about two years ago, a little bit more than two years ago, the service chiefs released the cooperative strategy for 21st century sea power, laying out how the sea services, or what the sea services wish to do. Last month, those same chiefs released the naval operation concept that said how they intend to do it. Could you give us a preview of coming attractions on how the sea services intend to address those difficult questions posed by SecDef Gates on getting the yeah. force structure right and the force mix right? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, thanks for the question. That, that's uh, uh, pretty much what we do as we work our way through the, the budget process, uh, where we come together and look at what are the capabilities that we need. And, and the Secretary is I think the, the same type of questions that, that we've been you know, posing here. Um, what should that structure be? What should the mix be? Uh, and as we work through the, um, the process, uh, I'm in, in constant contact with Jim Conway as, as our staffs are in, uh, are in contact. Does that mean that we agree on absolutely everything that we deal with? No, it doesn't. Uh, but it does mean that we are constantly in dialogue about how we go forward. Uh, similarly with the Coast Guard, we come together uh, from time to time and I see the Commandant probably twice a week when we're in the tank for the, 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 when the Joint Chiefs come together on a variety of topics. So there's a constant dialogue that, that goes on there. Trying to come to grips with what are the types of warfighting capabilities that we as a maritime force believe the nation needs. Is, uh, is something that I think with the strategy, with the operational concept, that we are now in, we're better synchronized and we have the methods and the means to have the types of important discussions that we need in the future. So, well with that, uh, I'm gonna have to take off and jump on an airplane here, but again, I, I would like to thank each and every one of you for being part of this discussion. Uh, the next couple of days, I think, are going to be absolutely terrific with the speakers that Phil has laid on. Um, but I would also tell you that the benefit of, of the uh, forum for all of us will be the engagement, the questions that you have, the comments that you have. Uh, so I'd encourage all of you to not be shy, and I don't think you will be. Uh, but again, I, I thank you for the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with you. 
and uh, and have a great couple of days here in Newport. So, thank you. Okay, we'll have about a two-minute uh, delay here before we start with the next speaker, if you'll just stay and remain in your place, um, and we'll get started. Now, for the Q&A, just uh, if you haven't caught that already, the, the microphone does have a button. So uh, push on that button as hard as you can. I know we have some work to do on our end uh, to try to uh, correct some of that intermittent uh, audio. Right. So we'll, we'll be with you in just a minute. <laughs> 